I need my glasses. Hello everybody, we would like to begin. Please take a seat. <coughs> Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for joining us today. This is a joint event held by the Ministry of Environmental Protection and the Society for Protection of Nature in Israel. And together with our distinguished speakers from Israel and for Switzerland and Germany, we hope you will enjoy this session focusing on active restoration of ecosystems during global change. Specifically on this theme day, dedicated to biodiversity, we will talk about the linkages between climate change, biodiversity loss, and other anthropogenic threats like pollution. These threats affect our ecosystems and create climate risks. The climate and biodiversity crises are linked in many ways, and as we will see today, the solutions are linked today. From COP to COP, it has become more and more evident that, this, that, that what we need for nature, uh, for, if we want to reach our climate goals, we need nature. All of our efforts to solve the climate crisis have to include biodiversity as a major concern and consideration. In many densely populated countries like Israel, natural areas, areas are becoming more and more limited and more fragmented and threatened, not only by development in agriculture, but by, cli but by climate change too. But we also know that the natural environment plays a key role in mitigation of greenhouse gases by carbon capture and storage and in its NNR adaptation measures. Unfortunately, at this point, protection and preservation of nature is no longer enough and other actions need, are needed if we want to halt and reverse biodiversity loss. So rehabilitation and restoration of ecosystems has become vital. But in many cases, even restoration is not enough anymore, and we need to create a new natural environment from scratch, or as we call it, rewilding. From now on, it is essential that we scale up actions that can not only protect nature, but can restore it and build its resilience for the future. So this event is intended to demonstrate how restoring destroyed natural areas and degraded open spaces such as marshlands, rivers and winter ponds in the rural environment can reduce climate risks, prevent biodiversity loss and even enhance natural phenomena such as bird migration in an international pathways. We will also demonstrate how urban nature can play a key role in adaptation by providing nature-based solutions that can mitigate urban conditions such as urban heat, islands, and floods. These actions will also allow biodiversity to thrive in the urban environment and will provide accessible nature to the public. I hope that the presentations will provide a fertile platform for learning and sharing experiences, practical solutions, and successful projects. Um, these practical solutions have ecological, climatic, social, and um, ecological opportunities and benefits. These practices also demonstrate the synergies between central government, local authorities, NGOs, and the businesses, which is something so important. The event will conclude with a Q&A discussion panel with our speakers. I am honored to invite our first speaker, Dr. Bertrand Picard is the founder and president of the Solar Impulse Foundation and is also a UNEP Goodwill Ambassador. Dr. Picard will be talking about the connection between ecology and economics, and he will demonstrate the framework which allows nature protection to become economically viable. Thank you. Does it? Yeah. Good afternoon to everyone. 
I'm not here because I flew around the world and over the pyramids of Egypt with a solo powered airplane. No, I'm here because I know that solutions to protect the environment exist, they are available, and they are economically profitable. And this is why I'm especially frustrated when I listen to the speeches and negotiations in the plenary sessions. What do we hear? We hear a long list of the problems of climate change that we all know by heart, and it finishes by we have to do something without telling what to do and how to do it. That means that we still, after 30 years, focus on the problems and not on the solutions. And this is why with the Solar Impulse Foundation, we have actually worked on identifying everywhere in the world solutions that would reconcile ecology and economy. And why is that so important? Because of course when you speak to climate activists, it is enough to explain that we need compassion for the environment, that life is a miracle on this planet, that nature is beautiful and we have to protect it. But the problem is not the language of the key decision makers, for whom the language is about job creation and profitability. So we also need to adapt the narrative to the key decision makers. We have to show that protecting the environment is more profitable than destroying it. We have to show the economical opportunities in decarbonation. In other words, we should make the cops the other way around. Instead of negotiating on how to solve the problems, we should put all the solutions on the table and the collaboration between the countries would be helping each other to select the best solutions for their specific situations and needs. Can you imagine that we identified until now 1,450 of these solutions that reconcile ecology and economy? For the field of water, energy, construction, mobility, industry, agriculture, waste management, circular economy, they are all available. But when I speak to ministers of energy or ministers of the environment here around in all the bilaterals I have, they tell me we don't know about these solutions. Can you imagine that still now at the 27th COP, the specialists don't know that the solutions exist and they don't know which are the solutions. So when we speak of biodiversity, it's even worse. Because for, bi for biodiversity, a lot of people don't even understand the situation. We are, for biodiversity, in an absolutely incredible paradox. We live in a capitalistic world and capitalistic economy. What is the definition of capitalism? <laughs> it is to grow a capital. We have several capitals. There is human capital, there is economic, financial capital, there is the net natural capital. And the natural capital is not grown by our system, it is destroyed by our system. And this is an absolutely unbelievable thing. Just look at the numbers. The global GDP is around 24,000 billion of dollars. What we consider to be the value of the natural resources and the biodiversity on Earth, that means what allows our life to be possible on Earth, is worth between 120 and 140 thousand billion dollars, more than the global GDP. And people continue to destroy it. So there are, of course, solutions to protect biodiversity ecological and economical solutions. We have identified in this group of solutions, for example, uh, if you need to build a marine construction, you can use a special concrete, eco-concrete, that uh, reconstitutes a marine ecosystem. The way it is built, the shape and the substance, allows algae, uh, shells, everything to grow much better and you can make a new coral reef with these type of things. Of course, there are things like that. 
But besides that, what do we see? We see that there is a huge lack of common sense, a huge lack of regulations. So everybody is screaming about deforestation. Everybody is screaming against illegal fisheries. But when it comes to buy oil palm, uh, palm oil or soya from the deforestation, nobody is crying against it. Everybody buys it. We buy the result of illegal fishery. And there is an incredible moment where it was asked to, the for, to one of the former prime ministers of France to officially welcome Chief Raoni from Amazonia, who spends his life trying desperately to save biodiversity in Brazil. And the prime minister of France said, I cannot do that. We're trying to sell fighter jet planes to Brazil. So you see that it is sometimes possible to reconcile ecology and economy, but in some cases, the cases that are outside the scope of new technologies, outside of the scope of technical processes, systems, softwares, devices, and products, and so on, we also need new legislations, things that are just common sense to protect our world, to protect us against the destruction that is not made by the pure capitalism, but made by the short-term selfishness of human being. So we have to ask for it, because it will not come on its own. Usually people understand regulation as more government, more state, more <laughs> obligations. Well, if regulation is understood like that, of course the governments will put as little regulation as possible in order to be re-elected or have a good reputation. But if the industry, the population, the NGOs, the financial world, the economical actors understand clearly the economical value of biodiversity, then maybe they can obtain a little bit more common sense into the decision of the, of the government. So we see we have to act everywhere. The low-hanging fruit, this is the technologies that exist like this, you can use them everywhere, you are more efficient. You are able to decarbonize. You're able to open new economical uh, opportunities. But outside of what technology makes possible, we need the intervention of key decision makers just to protect us. So you see how interesting is all these actions because it opens the complete scope of all the actions and each one has to do the one where he's the best at. We are the best at identifying solutions. Others are best at protecting biodiversity, but actually it's all exactly the same goal. It's to be able to have a good quality of life. And I'm a medical doctor also, I'm not just an explorer. And I believe that exploration today is not about conquering new territories. Humankind has been everywhere, even on the moon. Now the question is how to explore better ways of doing and better ways of thinking in order to improve quality of life on Earth. And quality of life, it's not just biodiversity, it's fighting poverty, it is health, it is education, it is human rights. Well, so many beautiful challenges. So many beautiful challenges. This is where we need explorers. And this is the type of people who have a meaning in this world and who will be remembered like the heroes of the 21st century. And we can all be part of this. Good luck. Thank you, Dr. Picard, for your enlightening presentation and for emphasizing the need for investing in nature-based solutions and in policy and governance, um, and, and I think it's, it's very insightful to start with our uh, event 
with your presentation and thank you very much for being here and honoring us with your presence today. I know you have to leave soon, but uh, we would be happy to collaborate further in the future. I would like to invite our next speaker, Mr. Jörg Andreas Kruger, President, um, he, he told me today that I can call him Jack. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> abbreviation, um, uh, President of NABU, the Nature and Biodiversity Union. And Mr. Kruger will share with us the German experience, examples and challenges of active ecosystem restoration that addresses climate change impacts in the rural and urban Germany. Thank you. So thank you for the friendly introduction and welcome here from the, uh, from the speaker's position. I'm really happy to be here and to show a little bit about the experiences which we have made in Germany with some of our restoration activities. But first, I want to start with uh, which direction I have to... Ah, yeah. <laughs> first, a um, uh, brief overview about the situation in Germany. For many times, we have just warned uh, the population and the politicians that climate change will bring our ecosystems and our societies really under pressure. And that's what we see now since five, six, seven years more and more. We have very, very hot summers. We have the urban heat problem. And we had uh, a lot of droughts for the agriculture and heavy rainfalls, uh, which causes flood catastrophes. You may have heard about uh, the catastrophe in the river, um, along the river Ahr where we had 100, around 170 people dying after three hours of rainfall and the flooding which uh, was caused by that. So the German society is at the moment very open and um, very under shock and under pressure and is looking really for solutions. And um, that's what I liked in the introduction from Mr. Picard as well. I completely believe that he is right. We have to look more on the solutions and not only on the challenges which we have in front of us. I want to present today our flagship restoration project. Jet, jet. Oh, uh, our flagship restoration project along the River Havel. The Havel is a river in the lowland of East Germany. It's a heavy, modi heavily modified water body. Was uh, used for navigation, especially in former um, to transport coal and oil from former West Germany to former West Berlin, which was always a problem, as you can uh, understand easily. And um, 20 years, no, 30 years ago now, a group of volunteers started to develop the idea of the restoration of the river and its ecosystem services. And after 15 or almost 20 years, then we could start the restoration project. And what we do is, Ah, there. Yeah. Okay. What we do is that we, on a length of 100 kilometers, um, uh, connect, reconnect the old arms of the river back to the river, that we um, um, put away some of the dikes which were too close to the river, and that we um, reconnect with the with the old arms, not only the, the old river arms to the river, but as well the, the villages. And that is something what, what we learned very um, at the beginning of the project, you can do such a restoration project which really changes landscape and which really bring back nature and ecosystem services in a completely modified landscape. You can do that only with the support of the people. And what our team there have done is that we had the positive um, uh, voters by more than 20 local councils, two regional councils, two, t two state level parliaments, and then the money from the federal government and the, from the uh, EU, uh, so that at the end everybody <laughs> is in line with the project. And these people become fans of the project. We are doing the restoration now for 13 years. We will do that until 2035 or 2040. The investment in total will be at the end, maybe we have 40 million now, but we were just discussing the next steps, so 50 or 60 million. And we bring together the money from the public and from the NGO side, which we easily can uh, get from large companies and from private donors which are interested in these kind of um, large restoration projects. Oh, so we are already here in Hamburg. Um, but I mean, what, what I really want to underline, when you go in a, in a landscape and you want to really do large scale, large scale landscape restoration, you have to do it with the people from the beginning on, and you have to think big. 
from the beginning on. You start small, but you have to think from the end, what is the, the status which you have uh, in mind for the end of maybe half of a century um, to, to have really a stable ecosystem. But now stepping to the, to the urban um, situation, we have still in some of the cities in Germany the, the discussions about more cars in the cities, more uh, concrete in the cities and less trees. And that's why we sometimes as an NGO have to really f to organize the fight against it. And um, that's what we have done in Hamburg, for example. We really organized a people's vote and we bring it, brought it to the polls. And we won that against the, the parliament in Hamburg. And now the, the, the government of Hamburg is, is forced to really protect and restore the, the parks and the greens and the waterways in the city to have the trees everywhere, uh, every there and w where they have to be. And that is something what I guess really bring people, NGOs and a, and a kind of restoration community together again. And what we do after such a people poll is that we have a lot of practical projects in the parks, in the park management, but as well as well uh, with s some uh, projects which I really like very much. That is the cooperation with social, um, um, social houses and uh, retirement homes that we really say, come, here we have a social place, people coming together or living there, and now we bring them together and we recreate nature uh, around these houses, around these institutions, and we, in, uh, we invite the people really Ah, here you can see that we, we invite the old people to be part of the project, for example, or the disabled people to be part of the project, and their families to be part of the project. And that means as well that you, come, that you really um, develop a kind of fan community for your restoration. And so it's never endangered anymore since no politician will go and say, okay, we'll get rid of that for a parking ground or something like that. And at the end, <laughs> of my very brief introduction, um, I want to just share some lessons learned. The one is that we, we learned as well that climate change is uh, faster than our restoration projects, so you always have to monitor and adapt. I guess um, it's obvious that we have to do that. Then the, the integration of the people from the beginning on is the, the most crucial point. If you forget that at the beginning, your project can die easily. You have no chance to, 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 uh, to heal that mistake at the end. The, the restoration project in a special way uh, never stops. So you have then the community, you have the monitoring, you have the adaptation measures, and that means you are constantly in touch with the project and the community, and that stabilizes your, your activities and make the success of the projects very visible to everybody, but you have to have that in mind, since you can't say after 10 years, okay, I go out and uh, do what you want with the project, then it's in, uh, in danger. And the last thing is really don't start too small, Think big at the beginning, think from the end, start small then with visible uh, smaller projects, but you always have a long, to have a long-term vision. So thank you very much for your attention. I hope we will good at discussion in the panel. And I hope I was in time. Okay. <laughs> we'll have more time for the Q &A. <laughs> so thank you, um, Jack, for sharing the German perspective. And I think that after you hear the, ecosystem, the um, activities and the, the Israeli experience, uh, we will see that we have a lot in common and even maybe create a future platform for future collaborations. And also I think that um, the emphasizing the society and the importance of the communities is something uh, to think about and something that we also do in Israel. But uh, I think that is part of the future. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Hanan Ginat the mayor of uh, a lot regional council in Israel. Dr. Ginat will talk about safeguarding and enhancing the bird migration pathway in, the, in an era of climate change by restoration of the Eilat salt marsh. Please. Good noon and thank you for inviting me to give a lecture. Just to present myself, I'm a mayor I'm a geologist, but as a mayor, I understand that uh, we need to take care for all the hemispheres of Earth. 
begins with the geosphere, continue with the hydrosphere, the biosphere, and of course the atmosphere. So I'll try to connect, not all of this, but this is part of talking about birding in our region and looking in the, uh, in the whole uh, space. And uh, we talk about enhancing bird migration by restoration of a lot uh, salt marsh. Here, how it goes. Huh? Ah. <laughs> okay. No, it's Okay, so just to locate ourselves, and this is the map and the climate map, and, the, and we are in the dark red, just at the north end of the extreme arid zone. And just to be sure that you're familiar, most of you Israelis, but not all, that we're talking about these fantastic landscapes in our region, and in this fantastic area, connecting to our settlements there, and agriculture, with dates, people who are traveling, trekking from all over the world in our region, and now coming to the birds that uh, are also like the region, but like it as a stop, as a place to stop in the way uh, between Africa and Europe and in the, <coughs> in the way back, uh, the Elat and Arava uh, region. Now, yes, this, is, this will be the most important uh, uh, slides because it presents the issue that is connected to climate change. Habitats move away from the equator. That means longer migration routes. Spring start earlier, birds need to migrate faster and we'll soon see the results. And desertification desert, crossing challenge are <laughs> challenges uh, increases. These are all three aspects that are connecting to climate change and the uh, global climate change and how it affects the birds that are coming just to rest, to feed themselves in the way. So now let's look in our region. Yes, this is the Gulf of Aqaba and Elat. This uh, is from 1918 before Aqaba, before Elat, just ahead of the Gulf, that uh, we are just in the south part in Sharem. And the, we are talking about Elat uh, <coughs> salt marsh, a magical forest, no dependence on rain. As I said, we are in extreme arid zone. We have one inch of rain in our region, but a big, enough amount of uh, groundwater uh, the things can uh, go on and plants and uh, uh, natural plants could uh, uh, go on and could be uh, the stop for the migrating uh, birds. So here we are nearly today, not 1918, and just to say this is the, reason, this is the region beside, by the way, Aqaba on the right side, the border between Israel and Jordan, and the region near Elat and the north in the east part of Elat, with many things that were artificial, that were uh, developed, connecting to, uh, uh, to Elat uh, factory, of course, the cities, the hotel, and so on and so on. And in this region, the development of uh, uh, sites uh, uh, for birding. Look at this wor very worried frightened graph that present the number of migrants <coughs> recorded in the Elat ringing station. It is a very active ringing station in Elat, and we see the uh, decrease of the amount of birds that were uh, <coughs> recorded there. And I think this graph presents a very big problem that we have. So we're talking now back from Elat just to the region, the equator in the green color, Elat as we see us, not far from Sharem, and talking about uh, the distance that the birds should do from equator, even south to the equator, uh, uh, north to Elat. And 
the weight of the birds, also very worried uh, <coughs> a figure, uh, numbers that present the, the weight of the birds uh, from 1940 and until 20, uh, sorry, sorry, 2014 to 2022, and it presents the problem that is what I said before, following the, uh, <coughs> the problem that was be before, because of the desertification, the widening of the desert, and so on. <clears throat> so, the birds are coming from south or from north for the, for the rest, for the stop. And there are different sites to stop, natural sites, most of them, but some are artificial sites. And somebody told me, I'm researching there as a geologist, and he said, hey, look, this is the restaurant of the birds. So, it's restaurants in several sites in the region, and one of the uh, the thing that I want to give two examples of restoration and the uh, re rewilding and, uh, and management of it. And this is the birding site that uh, uh, develop uh, in the sewage work, uh, not far from the city of Elat. And the idea was to take an open space, a sewage site, not an open space, sorry, a sewage site and to develop it as a place, right place that the birds can stop, can stay, can refill them, uh, themselves uh, uh, just uh, uh, along, along the way, along what we call the Rift Valley. So this is the restor <coughs> restorated salt marsh that is here in a, a lot. Remember the figure from 1918, so now it's really different. By the way, a lot Part of the plants are natural, but part are, were renewed following uh, uh, the birding and the birding site. And here we can see uh, part of what we develop and try to do, several organisms together with the uh, uh, <coughs> Ministry of uh, Environment and the Rashut Ateva Vaganim, Achevra, and the, our region, and of course, Elat also, part of it. And how we do it? Well, uh, first, <coughs> conservation and improvement for biodiversity. This is one issue uh, with developing. Taking care of hazards, because some is artificial. So we need to take care of hazards and keep the birds uh, that will be safe. And visitors' infrastructure that respects the need of the wildlife is also part of uh, uh, what we need. By the way, I didn't give credit, but the one who present most of the presentation and asked me to replace him, he's now in a birding uh, uh, workshop in Elat, is uh, Dr. Noam Weiss, uh, that put uh, uh, most of the figures is him. So he's the guy who leads the, uh, the birding center and uh, uh, looking and <coughs> all of them. Now, the idea is to continue to plan, to continue to develop it, to develop it correctly with all the risks that are in the artificial region and with knowing the very uh, worried uh, uh, numbers that we saw before and understand if we can do what we can do to do, uh, to do it better than it is. So here we are in our birding sites things uh, that are here. What is this picture for? Just keep the birds not to sit on electricity cables, but on these woods that they can, be, can rest if they need to keep themselves. Here we are, more things for the developing, and here's one of the birds that found rest. And here are they, and we're talking about biodiversity, so this is one of the issues, and nice to see the amount and high amount of birds that are a uh, decide in the way to rest in our region. For the end, just to say there is a global effect of climate change that influences the birds' migration. 
we, did, we are not feeling the climate change in our region. I think not in Sharm el-Sheikh also. It's extreme arid zone. But looking at the global issue or the issue between Africa and Europe is very, very impact and the hyper arid deserts are on the edge on the scales of habitats organism. And looking at this map with all these very worried questions. Thank you. And see you along the immigration birds flyway. Thank you, Hanan, for your in inspirational presentation. And I think you can uh, defini definitely qualify as, a, as an ecologist, not just a geologist. Um, so uh, we will invite you to our conferences in the future, Hanan. Uh, um, I just want to point out that the, the, one of the projects that Hanan was referring to is part of our business and biodiversity project. It's a joint project with the uh, businesses uh, the Ministry of Environmental Protection, um, the Society for Protection of Nature, and the Nature Parks Authority. And we have been doing these kind of projects for more than 15 businesses in the last few years, and we're expanding it to more and more businesses as a voluntary uh, project. But we hope that in the future, um, some of these things like light pollution will become uh, compulsory uh, in regulation. Our next uh, speaker is uh, Mr. Asaf Zanzuri from the Society for Protection of Nature. Asaf will talk about the Startup Nature Project that focuses on rewilding of abandoned fish pools in Israel. Thank you, Asaf. This one or I need to stand? I have to stand? Okay. Not good in standing up. And thank you, Tamar. And it was very refreshing to here, uh, Mayor talk about uh, our stuff, and it was amazing. Thank you. And uh, oh, okay. Thank you. Now it's okay. I want to talk to you about uh, today about the climate change, of course, but the biodiversity crisis. And I think we don't hear a lot about the biodiversity crisis. We don't have this convention for biodiversity crisis in its. Uh, it's a crisis that happened today. We see it. We don't need to wait for the climate change or something else. You, you don't hear? Ah, OK, sorry. And uh, I want to talk about the connection between the climate change and the biodiversity crisis and what are the solutions we suggest. To understand the biodiversity crisis, we need to understand the ecological footprint. The ecological footprint is every change we make in the uh, natural environment. It can be something as obvious as building, agriculture, even foresting. If you plant a forest in a forest habitat, it's okay, you don't have a, an ecological footprint. But if you plant a forest in the desert, you create an ecological footprint. And why it's, import it's an important thing to understand the ecological footprints? Because we talk about it in a larger scale. In a larger scale, we create the biodiversity crisis. Ah, okay, it's going that way, sorry. And what is the connection to the climate change? There's a, a few connections, but I want to talk about the problem before the solutions. And in Israel and around the world, we want to pass from fossil gas to green energy. And it's very important <laughs> and uh, very, uh, very important uh, thing, and we need to do it fast and efficiently. But when we try to solve one problem, sometimes we create another problem. And here you can see the solar panels on the lens, and it's in big and uh, large scales, create the ecological footprints and the problem for the biodiversity. And, and if you can see, uh, we create uh, wind uh, energy and we create another problem for the biodiversity and for the bird and other animals. And what we want to say is when we want to stop use one energy and move to another energy, we need to do it in a responsible way. 
we, we don't want to create one problem and try to solve another problem. Ah, uh, sorry. And what is the connection between the climate change and the biodiversity crisis? You need to understand that biodiversity have different habitat, create different offset for carbon. But in order to do that job and create an offset to the carbon, we need a functional habitat. With that functional nature, it can create the other effects and accelerate the climate change even. And in the last 100 years, we lose almost half of our natural land. And that, that connection is very uh, f fast, and we, we can see the changes only in 100 years. Ah, sorry. And now, because uh, a picture's worth a thousand words, a movie, for, I don't know how, how much is worth, but you tell me, I put a short movie. Stop talking. Israel is well known as the startup nation for its high tech and research, but very few know that Israel is also one of Earth's top biodiversity hotspots. How we protect and restore nature here matters around the world. My dream is for Israel to use our innovative spirit to restore nature, bringing us and the world to a much better place than where we started. This is the vision of Startup Nature. Israel lies at the junction of one of the world's largest flyways. Twice each year, hundreds of millions of birds stop here on their migration between Europe, Asia and Africa. And every year, 400,000 people come to witness this natural wonder. Without Israel's wetlands, these birds would not have enough food and water to survive their harsh journey of thousands of miles. But as one of the smallest yet fastest growing countries in the world, our wetlands are disappearing. Now the future of these birds and the nature of three continents is in our hands. For bird migration, this is one of the most important places in the world in a junction of three continents. The potential to develop research, tourism, education here can make us a top leader in the Middle East and in the entire world. Israel is taking the lead, demonstrating that with wild in these places, we can not only bring birds back, but also repair our relationship with nature. Startup Nature seizes a unique opportunity to transform unused agricultural lands into fully functioning wetland habitats and then build them into a network of world-class wildlife sanctuaries. We'll be preserving one of the world's most important bird migration fly routes and generating millions of dollars for the local economy now and for generations to come. The first two sites, Farupin and Magad Mikhail, will save millions save you the rest because afterward we we looking for money and uh, it's not uh, for you <laughs> and um, okay what we see here is talking about wetlands and it's talking about uh, using a, an opportunity to restore wetlands but this is not the only thing we want to do in startup nature you see in this conference, everybody talk about the technological way to stop the climate change or deal with the climate change. We want to talk about something more holistic and talk about how we can preserve nature. The first thing we need to do is preserve what we have. But sometimes we don't have nothing to preserve because we destroy most of the habitat, like the wetlands, and we need to create from scratch. And this is the rewild. And it's not only our idea. You can see it in the world. They talk about nature good, nature positive. It's stopping the biodiversity crisis. And pass to 
a different kind of uh, an environmental uh, improvement who can stop the climate change or help with the climate change. Uh, uh, this is one of our projects in Kfarupin. You can see the before, what we, we started to do only a few years ago, and this is after only a couple of years. The change happened very fast. We, we bring water from uh, the stream, and the nature responds very fast, and we have a functional wetland. And the idea is not only to create it in wetlands and every habitat we don't have the places to preserve and restore. We, we want to do rewild and restore nature. And here you can see the Jordan River only 100 years ago. And today uh, the, uh, the, today it's uh, look completely different and we want to do rewild in both sides. We started a project with the Jordanian and they do a, a rewild in their side and we want to do a rewild in our side and create a regional uh, project who can sh give back the nature for the Jordan River and after other places. And uh, thank you for listening. And uh, I'm hoping uh, we do it very fast because we don't have a lot of time to do it. Thank you, Asaf, for sharing the Startup Nature Project. And I think you can also uh, qualify as an ecologist. Asaf is a planner, but... Uh, <laughs> so we're transferring everybody into ecology. Um, and, and uh, Asaf just gave us a tiny little bit about uh, Kfarupin uh, restoration and rewilding project, but you can read more about the project and the contribution of other ecosystems to carbon capture um, and carbon storage in the new issue of Ecology and Environment a Journal, which was published yesterday. Um, that deals, uh, the issue itself deals with uh, um, uh, pollution and um, reducing greenhouse gases, and we have written um, an article about nature's contribution to that. So now we are moving on from open spaces to the urban environment, and we'll reconnect with the German experience. And I would like to invite uh, Ms. Miri Reis from the Jerusalem Munic Municipality. Miri will talk about Jerusalem's approach to natural resources uh, and the unique story behind the Gazelle Valley, which today is the biggest urban nature site in Israel. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Well, we have 12 minutes to talk about the interaction between the city and the nature resource, well-being, communal involvement, and social uh, cohesion. So, Jerusalem. Jerusalem nature are two, one of those two words that you hear with your heart and not just with your he ears. And Jerusalem is moreover is located in a geographical transition zone, which on the west side, it has um, Mediterranean climate. And on the east side, it has um, desert age climate, which therefore the Jerusalem has enormous species of inhabitants of plants and animals, unique um, landscape. And approximately 40% of the city area is open space and nature space. If we zoom in on the case of the Gazelle Valley, as Tamar mentioned, the Gazelle Valley is the largest urban nature site in Israel, and it is actually a product of a struggle of community from resident from the neighborhood nearby with the SPNI to convert a plan, a plan to build over a thousand 
housing units in Jerusalem into a park. The Gazelle Valley is characterized with a variety of uh, species of uh, habitats of species of plants and, and, and animals which serve the biological diversity of Jerusalem in spite of its location within the heart of the city. So um, the Gazelle Valley is open all year round with no cost to everyone as part of the city approach of accessibility of well-being and welfare of all residents because nature is supposed to be open to all and all the residents resident supposed to be provided by the nature utilities. And last year, the valley got an, an international recognition as a nature-based solution for overflow maintenance because of the plan of how the um, ponds and the whole uh, drainage uh, system is uh, developed over the valley. Okay, but if we are going to the city level, the phases to maintain and to handle the natural resource, the first step is to get data. And the first step is by mapping those sites and scaling it by an ecological value um, uh, scale. And on the right, you can see the map of those nature sites and with the differences by the ecology, uh, the colors reflect the ecology value, uh, the ecology scale. And after, and in the same time, you have to increase as Jack or Jörg, Jörg, <laughs> it's okay. As Jörg says, you have to, to, uh, to make a more social interference and involvement within these processes in order to engage, to, to engage them and to, to uh, raise their awareness and their um, activity around those uh, si nature sites because they are the best protector. The people are the best protector of the nature, nature va uh, values. In Jerusalem, after mapping, after having the data, the Amir Amrotem that sit here, a man with a great vision, has established, has formulated the, uh, a unique uh, master plan to preserve urban nature. Jerusalem is the only city in Israel that has a master plan. It's a regulatory master plan. It means that every building plan that, cont that is on a nature, uh, uh, urban nature site, supposed to be to 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 refer the ecological values and to adapt the plan in order to preserve those values. So, um, but this plan lays on data. So, first have the data, collect the data, monitor, and then have communal engagement and um, strategic strategic um, um, plan and actual action plan. I think that all of the people here know a bit about the ecosystem services that contain three pillars, cultural services, supply services, and regulatory services that in terms of mitigation and adaptation as we talk about climate change it protects us it protects us it provides us what we need the essential needs as a human being this uh, ecosystem uh, gives us and we um, and in terms of 
climate change, this is the best solution, just to see how we keep th those systems and, um, and live better. Okay. This is a, just a timeline of what happened from the decision to have this general master plan for the whole city and then how with the SPNI, the mapping and how step by step we got to 2018 when we, the, the Jerusalem Committee of Planning approved the uh, urban nature site uh, master plan and that we are working with her now. I'll just skip it. How it works. This is just an example of how, how it works. We can see an actual plan is not approved plan by now, but it's just an just example. You can see that a, pl a building plan that is on a field with high value, ecological values, the, was obligated to, to conduct an, an ecological survey on the left, you can see the findings of this survey. And as a result, the original plan now narrowed the, the original plan and, and offer a different plan, which the building is more dense and keeping a green belt in order to preserve the ecological and the biodiversity that in this area without destroy the whole field. And this is take us to the uh, municipal program plan for uh, climate change adaptation and mitigation and how it go uh, and how the natural resource and preserving it comes into the whole plan. Well, I won't expand on the workflow, but it is important to say, to note that the action plan is a result of a multidisciplinary approach and a civil, uh, civil society team was also with us from the municipality, from the environment protection ministry, the energy protection, the energy ministry, all of us gather together to, con to, to formulate an action plan for Jerusalem. The general threat is extreme summers, extreme wind winters, and we emphasize the vulnerability of the city. The implication is heat loads, fires, floodings, um, the dependency, the, the dependency of energy from out of the city and not within the city. We, after a long process, we uh, formulated five management courses of action with it adapted street, energy resilience, community resilience, clean air, urban nature, and urban nature uh, preservation, and the outcomes that we want to gain is health and resilience and, se and security to the resident. We want to reduce risk and hazards. And we find that we can have economical opportunities by conducting those action plans. There were three strategic pillars to that plan. The first one is how to maintain and to preserve the urban nature in Jerusalem. The second one is uh, s management of energy and sustainable transportation. I'll, I'll zoom in <laughs> to the urban nature management and preservation. As I said, approximately 40% of the city area is nature. And First thing, the mayor had this resolution that in the next decade, we are keeping 
of 40 percent, 38 percent of the of the city area as a urban nature. Um, we want to duplicate the Gazelle Valley to additional two additional parks are in in planning progress those days and next year we hope to um, to start with planning of a third gazelle park and we have a, pl a plan of uh, metropolitan parks and um, ecological uh, system through um, treatment management prevention of wildfires and uh, maintaining uh, preservation parks. Thanks. Thank you, Miri. Um, I think here clearly we can see how Jerusalem thinks big. And you're talking about taking one small project, but also um, thinking large scale and long term. I think Jerusalem is, uh, is, um, shows us how we can do it. And also how you can integrate into policy climate change and biodiversity at, at, uh, at, uh, in urban, big urban cities. So thank you for that. And our last but not least speaker is Mr. Amir Balaban from the Society for Protection of Nature, who will talk about the Urban um, Wildlife Initiative and why nature-based solutions are at the front line of urban resilience. Thank you very much. Uh, happy to be here with uh, friends from the Ministry of the Environment, municipalities, academia, friends from uh, international friends. Um, I would like to uh, go straight into this uh, wild adventure. And we all know that urban uh, habitats are one of the key factors in climate change. And this is where most people live in. So if we want to tackle climate change, we have to work with people. And if more than 8 billion people, more than half of them live in cities, the cities cannot be excluded from the solution. Uh, just to uh, give our guests, our foreign guests, some uh, understanding, Israel is a very, very small country. So we're not only focusing on technological developments, but also we're trying to see how we can manipulate and work with our urban areas in such a way that nature is a base for a solution. So we must understand that Israel is unique because most of our uh, cities, some of them actually have developed 3,000 years ago. So we have a continuous urban uh, uh, laboratory that shows us how nature reacts to, uh, 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 to urbanism. You can see three typical cities in Israel. Some of them are, are very, very old. And the way they look today is only during the last 100 years. Most people think that, that cities exclude nature. And this was uh, a main uh, idea that was uh, the base of creating conservation areas that focus on nature. But we see that nature is stronger than our infrastructure. These are a few examples of uh, the damages and lots of life during the last few years due to, climate, uh, ch due to climate change. You can also see how wildfires affect the Mediterranean areas. This is a fire that uh, 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 a blaze that uh, nearly uh, struck Jerusalem a year ago and I'll finish off with this blaze and look at the amount of damage and the economical loss and this is something very very troubling because we need to tackle this in a much more um, uh, systematical way we're not leading because this is done internationally but you can see by the graphs in the middle the red is our effect on climate per square kilometer and in the the second, uh, uh, this one here shows how much Israel is doing about uh, climate change and we're way behind. So the question is how do we start working on an international basis? And this is something very important. The na a nature-based solution is the low-lying fruit, meaning we can work with nature immediately and use nature in a, I would say, in a very uh, uh, wide range 
of uh, climatic effects on our, uh, on our civilization. This is why solutions that I'll show you can be uh, uh, used in cities all over Israel, in desert areas, Mediterranean areas, and coastal regions. So one of the things we changed or we're working on with the Ministry of the Environment is the perception that municipalities are not in charge of their nature. This is not something that belongs to a specific government uh, institute, but it belongs to everyone. And the way to do it is by creating a national database for biodiversity. This is an ongoing project that has been running for over um, uh, 10 years. And most of the country has been already mapped, meaning every city has an infrastructure database, a GIS-based uh, uh, database that enable the municipalities to manage their own habitats and plan according to this infrastructure. This is Nestiona, a small town in the central part of Israel, and you can see the 36 sites that belong to this munici municipality and enable Nestiona to create its own policy, saving what's important, and everything is d designed in such a way that it's a one-stop shop. All the information is based on this GIS-based uh, survey. So you can see everything is mapped, including uh, pollution and things that a municipality has to take care of and deal with. Now, policy making is a, a, a long-term project. There is already an existing national policy that the, uh, that the uh, Ministry of the Environment has already published that we are working with. So this is something very, very important, and we see that cities sometimes make their own, which is even better. So the policy not, not only directs uh, the planning boards, the urban planning boards, what to develop and what not to develop, but how to manage wildlife and nature in cities. And this is a tedious job because sometimes it means a lot of texts and, and, and how to work with different, uh, with different uh, infrastructures, natural infrastructures. But the most important thing is involving ecologists in the planning and running of urban areas. And here you can see how these are implemented, for example, on the use of herbicides in urban areas, which also affect the health of uh, uh, people. And now we're going to go into the projects themselves. We have been leading, together with partners in municipalities all over Israel, the construction of community urban wildlife sites, which are different from nature reserves because they don't put nature first, they put people and nature on the same level. This is why they're so successful. So this is the Jerusalem Bird Observatory. This is the House of Parliament, the Knesset, just above. So we have actually managed to build a rewilding project next door to the parliament. And this is how it operates. It basically focuses on science, education, and bringing people and nature together in a very expected place. The Gazelle Valley Park, which Miri mentioned, is our scale up because rewilding and you know from different other different uh, subjects in life size does matter the larger the project is the more effective is on local climate and national climate so you see here how this project also affects the community in such a way that we bring people from different uh, walks of life to meet and understand their local uh, uh, nature. And here you see the effects on how we treat problem, uh, a problem the uh, drainage systems and how we fix these problems by using nature-based solutions and creating water systems that enable us to filter urban, uh, urban water but also incorporate traditional means of land management which is very very important. Old terrace wall have been used for ages. So we have to look at our history. For example, this green roof project, or how do we treat this polluted runoff water? And we've mentioned and we've heard about th the effect of pollutants from urban areas on rural areas. Well, we want to treat the pollutants in our projects. And this is what happens after two weeks of circulating this polluted runoff water. 
Okay, so this is a very important project that shows that with relatively little amount of money, we can reach large scale uh, uh, results, okay? So these are examples how we manage to create an infrastructure that also helps us with biodiversity. And here you can see how quick wetland rewilding projects affect a city that had never had a wetland on its side. And these are all photographs of migratory birds or native birds that come, but they also supply a focus for people to come and enjoy wildlife close at hand. This is very, very important. Just an example, an endangered species, the ferruginous duck, actually started nesting in Jerusalem. And we see how an urban rewilding project helps out uh, a, uh, an endangered species. And here we're upscaling not only the biodiversity, but also the human capacity of the park. This is our new visitor center, plan to have a water laboratory and focus on uh, gazelles. And this was taken two days ago. It's built by the Jerusalem municipality, and it's going to be a very, very intensive uh, visitor center. And this is another project from Tel Aviv. This is the idea. This is a, a wetland uh, project uh, in the Arkon Park, uh, in one of the most important uh, uh, streams in the uh, Israeli shoreline. This is the actual work, and this is a photograph taken a week ago of this project funded by the JNF and designed by SPNI, and it's in the forefront of urban development. So as we develop Tel Aviv and the city center, on one hand, we should rewild on the other hand. And these are the results. These were two jackals smiling at each other last week when we had the torrential rain. And this was an, an amazing experience to, to have because this is underneath these skyscrapers. And these are Tel Aviv, uh, 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 Tel Avivians, which are very cynical people. And you can see they're really having fun. And just to show you how we base our experience on the strength of nature, this is what happens after three weeks after the Jerusalem blaze. And this is what we do with our access or, or surplus gazelles that breed in the Gazelle Valley Park. They are released into the burnt area to feed on grass, minimizing tinder, okay? And just to finish, we can do rewilding on buildings. And here you see how we actually take public buildings and thanks to the Jerusalem municipality, recreate habitats on buildings. And now with the Tel Aviv municipality, rewilding streets. So the most important thing is these people. Municipality, professionals, mayors, and people who work in the different environmental units in cities and other places. And with them, we can partner up and make the difference. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you Amir, for um, whizzing through 20 years of experience um, in 10 minutes. Um, in promoting urban nature. And uh, on a personal note, I would like to thank you for your long-lasting partnership with the ministry. Amir? <laughs> Other people who know. Um, uh, Amir, I would like to thank you for your long-lasting partnership with the ministry. I think together we have produced exceptional results for the benefit of cities and biodiversity, and we have a lot more to do in the future. So thank you everybody for the excellent presentations and perspectives and solutions to the climate and biodiversity challenges we face today. I think we can see how collaborations between different sectors can generate solu solutions, positive results in innovative ways. And now I would like to invite you to the floor for the last part of the session that will focus on closing the gap between climate change and biodiversity loss. The panel will be led by Dr. Netta Lippmann, Depu Deputy Director General for Natural Resources and Climate Resilience and the Ministry of Environmental Protection. Please, our panelists.
Yeah, that's you. <laughs> and almost gender balance. Well, we have you, right? So with, with you, we're balanced. So thank you, everyone, for a great uh, presentation and giving fight to John Kerry. It just, just initiated some, I don't know, uh, uh, ocean. Uh, yeah. <laughs> We're not ocean. We're just. And uh, thank you so much. So we'll start. We'll have two rounds. The first one will be a specific question, and then I'll have like an open question. And um, same for everyone, and we'll do another round. So as our guests, we'll start with you, uh, Jörg Kruger from NABU. From your experience, what are the three main actions that, that make a successful restoration project? Oh, yeah. So I think... Um, I think it doesn't work, man. I think it's just the open door, which was <laughs> so overwhelming. Um, I mentioned already that you have to have a, a long-term plan or a vision in mind. And that is something, a problem when you start thinking and you start to small. The next thing is really the involvement of the local people. And the third thing is money, money, money. Um, to scale up is always so important to think about money. And what we experienced after the, um, the last summers is now that the, 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 the discussions in the society in Germany changed. And now the, the German government announced a fund of 4 billion for the next four years just for the restoration of ecosystems and doing something in the cities and so on. And there we can, we can talk seriously. I mean, normally you know public fundings are always a million here, a million there. That is nice. But for billion, it is good to have. For one year, for three years, for, for a billion year. years, how for, many? No, no, for, for four years. For, for four years. And what we learned as NABU, we organized our own, own climate fund to do peatland restoration. So peatlands is uh, in Germany a big problem, big source of uh, CO2 emissions. And we found a private investor, a large retailer. He, they gave us 25 million for the next four years so that we can lever the public funds. So money is there when you have good projects and when you, uh, when you have in the society a good discussion about the, 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 the needs and the values of ecosystems. And what I have heard now from Elat and Jerusalem and uh, Tel Aviv, uh, and it's, uh, I, I think it's easy to find then large-scale money for that in private sector as well, since it's so easy to understand that's necessary. Thank you. Um, Dr. Hanan Ginat, you're the next one. Is it possible to balance the need of the energy and water sector with, uh, with project biodiversity? Possible, yes, but very challenging. Now, Amir present towns in Israel, and we are talking about open spaces. And open spaces are very important, but the population are growing, the human population. It seems the birds, not really during the last years, but the... And I think, I believe that it uh, needs to work uh, what I'm calling as a, a need to have a balance between sustainable development and progressing development. And the idea is to figure the things together to take care of when we develop, now I'm, I'm, I'm wearing my mayor hat, when we develop things, we need to think about what is the effect of each one of them continue developing, but do it smartly. Thank you. And Asaf, now to you. How can the private sector help in developing more nature-based solutions? And you have now a target of four billion, so. <laughs> uh, I think uh, the money, money, money is uh, it's the most important thing, and we can see it in the private sector, and the private sector is starting to show some interest in the uh, environmental problem. And uh, we work with a company called Terra. They want to do offsetting and then getting the money from uh, private companies. It's a start. It's a little bit uh, cynical start and very focused start. But I think if the private sector will show the, pot the potential we have in the nature-based solutions, and think about their ability to help, we will see a lot of 
funds from that uh, direction is not only in, uh, government funds is very small like you said and we take a lot of time to, t to take it and add, after you take it take a lot of time to influence and uh, the private sector can do it very fast and uh, I'm hoping it's the start for uh, a new beginning yeah thank you Miri yeah. as a municipality Jerusalem how can the municipalities strengthen their role in preparing for climate change and protecting biodiversity? Okay, first, we think that we have to address the biodiversity and the nature resource as a solution and not just as a, something to tackle with. It's not an easy thing because Jerusalem is, is growing and there is... <coughs> a massive development needs in the city. So it comes with a conflict with the need to preserve the, the nature and the biodiversity, as we said. So that, that is why we have first, we had the uh, master plan of uh, nature sites, which obligates every building plan to take in consideration the ecological value of what is in the field. And referring to the climate change program, one of, we, we picked the, the climate, the, the nature resource, the maintaining of it as one of the pillars, strategies in order to, and many, many action plans from that a um, whole set of actions is, uh, ref refers to, to maintaining and preserving the nature uh, values of the city. It's not an easy thing to do. I'm not, I'm not promising that we will 100% succeed, but we, we, must, uh, we must... You're on it. We are on it, yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's a good start. And last, but definitely not least, Amir. Balaban, SPNI. After 15 years of conducting urban nature services, surveys in over 70 cities in Israel, what is the next step of the SPNI? We're aiming at practical uh, uh, work, meaning we are focusing on creating a network of community urban wildlife sites from Eilat in the south to Kiryat Shmona in the north and making sure that uh, every Israeli citizen, no matter where they come from or what the religion is, has uh, a quality habitat to enjoy five minutes away from their home. That's the idea. And making sure that the municipalities of Israel uh, uh, use and manage these habitats as they use any other urban infrastructure. It's a daily routine, something that is incorporated in our urban uh, way of life. Thank you. So that was the first round, and we'll start the next one with the like, same question to everyone. So we'll start with you, Miri, since we, we, yeah, we promote ladies' answer ahead of other uh, audience. Okay, looking forward, what is your biggest challenge when you think about solution to climate change and bio biodiversity loss? I think that the, best, the biggest challenge is a growing city, massively growing city in the circumstances of climate change. Well, that I think that we have to adjust our methodologies to those new circumstances. We are on it. Uh, I think that I mentioned Amir Amrotem before. is a man with a lot of vision. He's supposed to retire in two weeks, but he has many rights, uh, I think, in all Israel. Um, and we need to, to develop and to adapt and to think how we expand the methodologies that we are already conduct in order to, to be ready to the next year challenge. Thank you, Asaf, the mic is yours. 
Thank you. As a planner, I see the danger of uh, our cities and the humankind going to the resilient cities. You see it already in the speaking, like in Venice and after other cities, we need to deal with the climate change, and they don't go to natural natural based solutions. They're going to the engineer solutions, and they can create a lot of problems for nature. And I think the biggest thing we need to do is convince the cities in the world and the governments that nature-based solution can do the trick. They can help and they don't need to build walls in the sea to stop uh, the sea and they don't need to create any problem for nature to stop the climate change effect. And the uh, resilient cities can be uh, nature-based solutions and it can be together but it's a very problematic way to do it because uh, in planning, you want a, a solution we, you can point at and it will give you exact results. In, in nature-based solutions, it's more complicated than that. Thank you. Jörg? I, I, I think the biggest challenge is to, to really scale up the number of projects and for that um, we have to find the ambassadors. I mean, all these projects are linked to individuals who are the, the mover and the shaker. In a, in a good way of a project. And if you don't find them, then it's just a, a structure which is, is uh, supporting a project or something. You, you need, uh, especially for these long-term projects with a large involvement of the civil society, you need the right ambassadors. And to find them quickly, to bring uh, the things on the road, that is the biggest challenge since the concepts and the money is, I mean, it's not, it's, money is always a problem, but it's there. But to find the ambassadors for the societies and for the discussion in the societies in a time where all of our societies are a little bit under pressure and a little bit in separation and populism and all these things which are more splitting up societies. So that's my biggest challenge. Thank you. Hanan? Well, first, I, there is a first stage challenge is the man who lives in the extreme arid zone first to understand the climate change in our region. It's not easy at all, looking on temperature, humidity, uh, uh, precipitation, and so on. So this is on one end. On the other end, I think the big challenge is, and it's not directly connecting to, to what happened, is, uh, to, to the climate change understanding, is looking forward to developing. We want to develop a settlement, tourism, agriculture, industry, and so on, and so on, and so on. And the big, and, and it, Population is growing. In Israel, the population will double itself in 30 years. And will, it will affect also far away near Elat, in our region and Elat. But the idea is to find, as I said before, the equilibrium that we need to have between all the things and to do it correctly. This will uh, help uh, us, help the nature to help us, and I think it can uh, come, but we need to be very, very sensitive. Well, uh, I think uh, our main challenge is to convince uh, everybody on Earth that nature comes first. Technology comes second. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. If it's broke, try to fix it. And if it's not existent, rewild it, remake it, and make sure it's usable uh, for the long run. And if we can do that, I think nature can be the frontline mean to tackle climate change on a global level, but not only climate change, but also the different challenges we have, which are social uh, and economical. Uh, without nature, we cannot survive. So I think this is the main challenge on our national uh, level and also on the international level. Thank you all so much. Tamar, do you want to conclude? So thank you, Neta, and for all of you for uh, an insightful panel and presentations. And um, I hope you enjoyed the session, but before we wrap up, I would like to say thank you. Thanks to all the people who helped with this event. Um, thanks to the... To Thank you to the Society for Protection of Nature and Tamara, who's not with us today. Um, 
And from my experience, I have been to three uh, COPs uh, in Madrid, Glasgow, and here, and, and definitely the talk about nature is becoming more and more apparent. I think um, every COP there is, uh, nature is integrated more into uh, the challenge, into the solutions, uh, and into all the discussions that we had today, if it's society, if it's financial, uh, ecology, and, uh, and all the other aspects. And I'm sure we will get stronger because this is the solution. So I think um, it's becoming apparent. And I also hope, hope that uh, the CBD does the same with climate change talks about climate change as, as, as a, uh, an important issue in uh, the biodiversity framework. So um, it has been a privilege for me to chair this event at the COP27 uh, on Biodiversity Day in uh, the Israeli Pavilion. And I thank all of you for joining us today.